Hey guys, I'm going uh, to just pray for us before we go into worship. There's a lot of new faces in here, huh? I see some new faces. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Great. We're doing good. We ready to worship? Yeah. We ready to hear her testimony? Yeah. Gina Fairchild is doing her testimony this morning. Praise God for that. I've been looking forward to it, Gina. I have. Uh, let me just pray for us before we go into worship, guys. Jesus, we just love you so much. You are so, so awesome. And we just want to lift you high this morning, Jesus. I just want to know you more this morning. Through the worship, Lord, I pray that we would just sing a new song to you. That our hearts would just grow even deeper with you as we sing these songs to you, Lord. I pray that through... Uh, Gina's testimony that she would be lifted so, so high and that all of us would grow closer to you um, through just seeing what you've done in her life and, and who you are. It all points to who you are, Jesus. And I pray that through the message, Jesus, we would know you more, that we would just grow even deeper with you, Lord, and that we would just leave here today and, and just be awestruck by you. Lord, knowing that you are the one and only living God and, and just being at your feet in submission to you, ready to do whatever it is that you tell us to do, Lord. I don't want to miss out on a thing that you have for us. And so I pray that you would give us um, alertness this morning. The distraction that is trying to flood our minds, get that out. I, I noticed this spiritual battle that goes on with me on Sunday mornings where I'll wake up and I won't even be at church yet and there'll already be all this distraction flooding my mind. It could be stuff that I'm going to do through the week or uh, the discipleship that I got to do and, and, and not bad things, but it, it just floods my mind. And I lose sight of, of what's going on right here and now. And so I pray that you would get that distraction out, Lord, and that our hearts would just be inclined to you in this moment. We worship you, Jesus. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. So let's sing this together, guys. <laughs> The scripture says that, uh, man, if, if we know how to give good gifts, us sinners know how to give good gifts, how much more uh, will our Heavenly Father give us the Holy Spirit if we ask for Him? And so, as we sing this song, let us just beg for Jesus' presence to fall on us, guys, okay? <laughs>
you guys want to grab a seat real quick? Gina Fairchild. She's been with us for a little while now, uh, pretty close to the beginning of everything. And so like as I prayed this morning, thinking about Gina, thinking about what a blessing her and her whole family have really been uh, to me personally, and I know the church um, in general, it's been just awesome week in and week out to just look out there and see her and to be a part of not just the good stuff, but also the hard stuff that we've had to go through. Um, in, in Philippians chapter 2, as I was praying this morning about sitting here with her, um, it starts by saying, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. And I think that obviously that is supposed to describe uh, just the church's relationship, and it definitely describes our relationship with Gina and her family. Um, so uh, we, can, we can start just briefly talking about how I met Gina, um, you know, one of her, her kids, Ty needed some help and was um, incarcerated, like many of us when we started coming here. And so I remember, uh, Gina, you came to an overdose awareness, correct? I did. Tell um, us a little bit about that. Actually, I was having some issues about, uh, my son was in jail. I was happy that he was in jail. Um, <laughs> I'm sure any parent out here who's had to deal with that can relate. Uh, he's not on the street. And I was talking to a co-worker of mine and um, I said, what he needs is Jesus. There's all these treatment programs out there. And, um, my son grew up in church. Uh, he knows the way. And um, she said, oh, really recovered. Um, they just opened a sober house. I'm literally, like, just opened a yeah. sober house. Ty was the second person, I think, in the sober house. Yeah. Ever. And so um, when, when, see, and and in my own control, when I thought he was ready to get out, Ken's like, just bring him. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to let him out. I wanted to leave him in there. Um, yeah, so Gina had been talking to him, and she was going, hey, so me and her had been talking on the phone and praying. And, and that's what we would do every time I would talk to her about it. I'd be like, let's pray about it. Let's pray and see what Jesus wants to do. And, and it was, it's that fine line of where you're talking to somebody who isn't really ready yet. And at the same time, you feel the Holy Spirit going, you know what? If you put him at my feet, something's going to happen. One way or the other. One way or the other, something's going to happen when you encounter Jesus. And so um, I remember talking to her. She was like, she had just had a good visit with him. <laughs> and she was like, he's not ready. And he's saying this. And he's doing this. And I just felt the pull from Jesus to go, let's just see what happens. Let's bail him out. And let's take him in and, and let him encounter the love of Jesus and see what happens. And so... That's what we ended up doing, and uh, and Jesus, did, he, he has, he's worked in Ty's life amazing, and uh, um, really, we've seen Ty over the years that we've had him uh, just be transformed, but, so, tell us a little bit about that, what started to happen with you, because I know the family, uh, like, go ahead. 
you guys yeah. really didn't get together. I remember I have a picture of you guys all together yeah. still at the Knights of Columbus, where it was the first time in how many years that you guys were all together? Many. Many, like five or something. Like, yeah. I think it was that long yeah. that he has all these sisters and all this family and that hadn't really been together, so. I, I have six children all together. Um, my two daughters were kind of in a feud for a long time amidst um, Tylen, you know, running the streets and um, Tylen. Um, I just, I want to go back to the overdose awareness. Yeah, the first day I met Ken was at the overdose awareness and they had all these shoes out of people who have overdosed and that was like really big for me. Um, I actually work in pain management and um, to like see these shoes and realize like these are souls that are dying of this crisis that we have here. And um, so I, it just it just touched me in, in the way that this is a this is a not only a problem for me but it's everywhere. Um, and I never ever thought I'd even be in this situation. Um, but um, like Ken said, I had to let for, for myself, I had to let go and let that control go because it, it wasn't about me. Um, and I had to trust God that he'd do some work. Uh, it wasn't my addiction and um, my son had to own it and, and I had to trust God that he'd uh, intervene and help him overcome it. So um, I have six kids. So Tylen was getting baptized. Um, where were the we were at some church. Yeah. Um, and there is a, there's actually a little video of that. And so um, my daughter Sierra was in nursing school. Um, she was coming after a clinical rotation. She still had her scrubs on. Um, my other my oldest daughter Miranda. They hadn't talked for for quite some time. And um, my grandson was there, and uh, Tylen got baptized. And by the end of the um, service, and we were getting ready to leave. There was a pizza and a fellowship, and um, we were getting ready to leave. And both my daughters were crying and hugging each other. And it was like, oh, I never thought that would happen. So I got healing for my son. I had healing for my family, um, for my girls. Um, so the relationship with those, with my daughters had um, been healed for several months and Tylen was doing really well. Um, Tylen's grandfather passed away um, and that was really hard for him. He was very close to, to him. And I think that the hardest, see death and death in Christ, when, when you're saved, you view mourning so differently than you do when you're lost. Right. And all of my kids said to me, we don't know that Grandpa was saved. You know, we don't know that he's in heaven. Um, and we've tried to share that with him so many times. Um, and I know Tylen took that really hard. Uh, and my daughters took that really hard. Um, and then it wasn't a, a few months later, um, my daughter, Sierra, who was doing her clinical rotation, going through nursing school, committed suicide. And so, Tylen, you know, he had a rough, rough time with it. it it's, it's rough. Um, I joined a suicide survivor support group, and I was looking at these people, and um, they're, they're not living in Christ. Um, it's five years, six years down the road, and um, they're just stuck in a pool of darkness. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, there's days it's time to get up, hard to get out of bed. I mean, even today, sometimes it's just really hard to get out of bed. But you know, God lays it on me that uh, I can lay in bed and feel sorry for myself, or I can get out of bed and bless people the best I can, and either way, my circumstance is the same. So, you know, it's a choice that we make, um, but the, the peace I have in the Lord is <laughs> undescribable. Um, and I, I would imagine the only thing close to 
um, death by suicide would be overdose. This is pretty much the same thing. You know what your end result is going to be. You keep doing it. Um, but I, I remember it's been almost two years. Um, that I, it's, it's harder every day, to be honest with you. I thought when it first happened, that was the hardest um, moment of my life, but it gets harder every day. It's, it's not easier. Um, I just think about all those things she's missing, but the one thing is, is I know she was saved. I know she's in heaven, and I almost feel guilty for, um, for being upset about that. <laughs> Um, the bottom line that I have to say is uh, let people know you're saved. Share Jesus with everyone so that way if something happens to you, no matter what, at least they have that peace to know, hey, I'm going to see you again. And it's going to be great. Because um, that's what keeps me going, to be honest with you. Um, I know that's what keeps all of us going. And um, So tell us, real quick, you shared a, a story this morning from her daughter, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, so she has Sierra's daughter with her this morning and tell us that story this morning because that was like as I was sitting here reading this and I was telling her the scriptures I stood over there it was just this perfect picture of, of what this looks like um, and having like that childlike faith so go yeah. ahead and share that so um, she, Emma's just the cutest thing uh, she gets up early in the morning and when she gets her sleep boy she is just happy as can be um, she comes running in and she's like grandma, grandma I'm like, what? She goes, the sun is shining, and I was so happy. And she pulls me into the living room to see the sun rises up on that side of the house, and it's shining through the window, and she says, I'm so happy. And I just look at her, and I just think, can't we just all be like that? Like, so happy the sun is shining. And so think about that, man, how, how good Jesus is that on a morning like today where she even said, like, it was hard to get out of bed today. You know, Sierra's little girl comes running in and pulls her in there to watch the sunrise uh, that Jesus says that he, he lets his sun shine uh, on both those who are righteous and those who aren't. Just his goodness, just so people know him and experience his love. Um, and so real quick. Uh, and I'll never forget like that call that you gave me that morning. I remember it was a Sunday morning, and I'm trying to prepare a message, and I had no message. And I remember sitting there stressing about this, and I get this phone call from Gina about what happened with Sierra. And it was a moment that changed my life forever. It was a moment that changed my life forever that gave me clear perspective on things that really matter, things that don't, and having to go in there and just realizing, like, hey, uh, sometimes we can just get caught up in information and stuff like that. And it's just like, no, this is all really about Jesus, about who he is and about his love uh, and, and how important it is that people experience that and know him. Um, and so... It, it was it was the first time I had even ever done a funeral, um, and I remember wrestling through that with Jesus on on what to say and how to do that. But uh, it changed us. It changed the core group of the people in the church forever. We would never be the same after that day. Um, you know, Jesus used it for good. He used it for His glory, and He used it to transform people more and more into His image. Um, and and so, like, real quick, I want to just fast forward a little bit to what you're going through now. So um, you got some diagnosis or something like that, which is like, what are you, what are you going through now with your, your thyroid or all this stuff? Because you said you'd tell me more Sunday, and I figured it would be without a microphone. But well, now we have a microphone. And so like, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, because I want us to be able to pray for so Gina just, uh, about what's going on with her. So, so I, you know, amidst all of this, I thought I was just so depressed. And here I'm, I'm having a thyroid issue and you know that makes you tired and depressed um i haven't got a I, I received a diagnosis and then i saw a surgeon who said nope you don't have that so i'm going to go to another doctor and get a second opinion um and so they thought you had great graves disease graves is that what it was yeah. and now they're saying no so she's still working through that and it's really crazy because i i had no idea what we were going to talk about or whatever and then the <laughs> message title today is a dangerous diagnosis which is just crazy. It had nothing to do with any of this, but but uh, but it makes perfect sense. And so um, so as she battles through that, because I know a lot of times I see Gina on Sundays, and if it's not one thing, it's another. It seems like, and it's just one of those things where um, 
you know, like she expressed, only in Jesus can you go through any circumstance and have peace that, that can't be explained, that you can't find in this world. It has to be the supernatural peace that comes from Jesus uh, to comfort you in the midst of even the, the biggest trials and the biggest struggles. And so, yeah, so I, wanna, I want us to, to pray right now for, for Gina, if we could. Um, and so if you guys want to just, like, put your hands out uh, towards Gina, and I'm going to lay my hands on her and pray for her. Uh, Lord Jesus, I know that in the middle of all of the suffering and stuff that Gina has gone through, one thing has remained the same, Jesus, and that's you. That um, days, feelings, emotions, circumstances can go up and down, but Jesus, you are always a solid rock. And, and, and I've seen that. I've seen her lean on you, uh, Jesus, and you hold her up. Um, I pray, we pray uh, that you would continue to do that. That whatever is going on with her medical issues right now, Jesus, I would ask you to heal her. To completely heal her. That as she goes and sees these doctors that they would be dumbfounded. That they would look and they wouldn't find symptoms. That they would look and they would say, oh, we can't explain it, but all of us would be able to explain it. That it would be something that brings you glory, Jesus. That you would continue to surround Gina and her, her kids, uh, her grandkid, uh, with your unfailing love, Jesus. They'd constantly be made aware of how close you are how much you love them. And uh, Jesus, no matter what's happening with them, that you would constantly lift their hearts and their eyes to you. Um, and Jesus, I know that you want to comfort Gina in a way uh, so that she can comfort others. I think of her talking about going to that survivor's group and seeing even in that going... And there's just a lot of darkness and people are stuck in darkness. Jesus, would you use her to be a light? Um, would you shine a light in her and through her that attracts people to you? That people would look past her and they would see you, Jesus. That the only thing that would be able to explain the peace that she has is you. Is that she really knows you, Jesus. That she has a real relationship to you and that she's holding tight to you. And until you come back, Jesus, and she gets to be with you forever. We love you, Jesus, and we know, we know, Jesus, that you can heal her. We believe you will. And even if you don't, we know that you're going to do something for your glory. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, go ahead. Come talk. I just wanted to say um, one more thing. Uh, when my daughter passed away, um, the police had all of her belongings. It took me almost a year to get her purse back. And probably a couple months later, just to go through it. And I opened it up and she had like seven chapsticks in there. And I thought, boy, you got the softest lips ever, you know. <laughs> and I'm just crying. And um, she had a receipt from Dick's Sporting Goods. And I just thought, you know, does John at Sports Giving, sport, does Sporting Goods know that she's never going to go through his line again? Um, she had some dark chocolate Ghirardelli mint squares in there, which I indulged and thought, man, these are bittersweet just like she was. There's still a few left. I don't know how good they are. Um, and then I got to her, her badge and uh, her badge from the hospital. Um, and I flipped it over and there was the plan of salvation on the back. And I realized that at that moment that 
that's not love. <laughs> I realized at that moment that I lost my child, but God knows exactly how I feel. Um, Jesus died for us, and there's nothing that we experience here on this side of heaven that God does not <coughs> understand and know how we feel. Um, and there's peace in that for me. And um, I just love you all. Thank you for listening.
and the, and the sun and all that. I was um, thinking about this psalm I read the other day. I encourage you to read it sometime. It's Psalm 19, and it starts out by going, you know, heavens proclaim the glory of the Lord, and then it starts to talk about the sky, and it says that the sky displays his craftsmanship, right? And everywhere, you know, and I paraphrase a little bit, but everywhere, people of all languages see the sky, you know, across the world right now, we look up and we see the sky and we see Jesus in that. And it talks about the sun and it goes, man, Jesus, he, he put the sun there. Nothing can hide from its heat. And then the psalm just stops. And I, I, I read that the other day and I sat there and I was like, wow, you know, I was like stuff we, we kind of miss all the time uh, that, that shows the glory of the Lord. And so as the heavens right now, as we sing, proclaim the glory of the Lord, let us do that as well. As we just sing, we glorify your name, Jesus.
So as I, uh, well, one, as I was saying that song, I just couldn't help but think about every time the living beings give glory to Jesus, to the one sitting on the throne, that 24 elders drop down off their throne and take their crowns off and fall on their faces and put them at Jesus' feet and just worship them. Like that happens. Like all the time. Up in heaven. And I think it's so cool that we get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of entering into that. Like that's what this is as we do this this morning. This isn't, and we've been talking about it a lot lately. It's not just some box that you check off or something that you came to do, but like while we were giving glory to the one sitting on the throne, you know, there's just this awesome worship happening in heaven right now. And, and Jesus is being glorified. Um, and how awesome that we are allowed to be in his presence, that we're allowed to know him, that uh, he would choose people like us sitting in this room to come close to him and to save, save people like us. That's just amazing. And on another note, as I was filling up my winter, my windshield washer fluid this morning, um, I don't know about you guys, but like those those containers, you can never use the whole thing. <laughs> it's like you always have just like a little bit left, right? And and so like I'm at you know it's like five in the morning, four forty-five a.m. this morning, and. I'm out of washer fluid, and I'm, I haven't had to put it in this new car I have, and, you know, it's this big, huge suburban thing, and it holds more gas than, than you can imagine, and, uh, and so for the first time ever, I emptied out one of those containers in there, and I thought to myself, wow, what, what a concept. They made a bigger container that fit the whole thing. And the reason I tell you that stupid story is because this morning, Jesus wants to expand us. I just know it. As I sat praying in my office about this message this morning, as I sat praying in my office yesterday about this message, there is this thing that Jesus wants to do in us this morning that he wants to expand us so that we can receive more of him. Uh, I think it's a lot of times we're just, we, we, we cut ourselves off to the fullness of Jesus and there's just always a little bit left in the container there that we just can't take in, that maybe we read this and we get to a certain place and a lot of times we read this and I think we start to go, we just start to think symbolically. That's just a, I, I think that's just a normal human thing to want to do as you read this book, that you start to just think of things and there's things in this book that are just so mind-blowing and just so awesome that you just... You try to make sense of it, and you try and go, well, that's probably not what it really means. Or that's probably not exactly how it happened or something. It's just that human instinct to try and wrap our minds around the creator of the universe. And so Jesus wants to expand us this morning, because it's not as easy as just making a new container uh, Jesus is going to expand us. He's going to stretch us in our faith this morning. Because what I want to talk about is uh, a, a diagnosis and, and the dangers of, of diagnosis. And what that actually means and, and what made me even start thinking about this and start praying about this is because everybody's had the flu lately. Right? Everybody's had the flu. And it's just going around. And, and what I noticed was, what I noticed was, is that people would be sick and they would be kind of powering through it and you knew they were sick and they're just like, oh yeah, I don't feel good and you know, they're doing their thing anyways and they're kind of powering through it. But then they would go to the doctor and the doctor would go, you got the flu and then be bedridden. <laughs> people were like, oh, can you bring me soup? Can you bring me my food? Is there a bedpan? You know, like I just, I just can't function. And it wasn't until they got the diagnosis that all of a sudden it set in and like, I just can't, you know, like, I just can't go on anymore. And, and so like the diagnosis is, 
the identification of not just a sickness, but a problem. It's an identification of a sickness or a problem, and it's based on symptoms. And so what's scary about that is that a lot of times I think that the problem that's been identified is not really the problem, but it's a symptom. And so we kind of diagnose a symptom. And that's why you don't get better. That's why you don't get better. So I, I remember, you know, when I first, you know, I was young when I started having to go to recovery things and stuff like that. And, and, and they would tell me, you know, you're an alcoholic or you've been diagnosed with addiction or any of this stuff, you know, that they go, hey, this is a disease. You're going to have this forever. And your medicine is this, this, and this, you know, going to these meetings, doing this, doing that, staying away from alcohol. And I remember before I knew Jesus, I like... I, I, I would always find myself like shopping and I would be in the giant eagle or something and I would make a right turn and it'd be like the wrong turn and I'd land like in the liquor section and the, in the wine section and I'd just like, oh my gosh. You know, and I'd just be trying to get through there. And, and I remember even meeting with people and they'd be like, where do you want to meet? And we'd want to meet somewhere and they'd go, oh, it can't be at Applebee's. They sell alcohol there. You know, and it was just this thing where it was, it was just like, that because of the diagnosis, because of what they said about it, they were just like, you can never be around it, and you can never, you know, and, and then I met Jesus, and I got a whole new life, and he changed my desires, and he changed my thoughts, and he changed my triggers, and he, he changed my cravings. And so the things I used to crave that belonged to this world, I didn't crave those anymore. In fact, I didn't like those things, and I craved him. And, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about that today because I think it, it, it goes with everything, really, because there's this guy, Hezekiah, uh, in, in 2 Kings, and it, his story is in 18, 19, 20, I think. Uh, it might go into 21, and, and it's in Isaiah 38. And it's also in Second Chronicles 29 through 32 or something like that. But, you know, uh, Hezekiah, we don't, we don't talk about him a, a lot. Uh, but it says that, you know, he was a king and he ruled over Judah. And, uh, and he said he was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. And he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. Just as his ancestor David had done. And I think it goes on to say this really crazy statement about him. Let me see here. Uh, there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. And that's a, that's a statement. I mean, you start to think about King David and all that. And when I came across this and I was reading this. It was like, man, there was no king like him before or after. And I'm like, that's a huge statement to this Ezekiel guy. And so he was a king, and it said that he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. And the reason, uh, what he did anyway, that was pleasing in the Lord's sight was he removed the pagan shrines, he smashed the sacred pillars, and cut down the Asherah poles. And so what he did was he started to remove stuff that had nothing to do with Jesus. He started to take away things that other people worshipped. He started to get rid of things that other people looked to other than Jesus. And, and then it says that he broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. And so like, I want to talk a little bit about this bronze serpent. It's in Numbers uh, chapter 21. It starts at verse 4. And... So it says that he broke this thing up. It was this bronze serpent. In Numbers 21, it says the people of Israel had set out from uh, Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient. What's up? The people grew impatient with the long journey. And they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? They complained. Just a real quick side note. They became impatient with the journey. You know, as the other day we were sitting in a leadership meeting and I just had this realization that a lot of times we complain and moan and grumble about the journey. And when we do that, it's because our eyes aren't set on the destination. And so, like, these guys were headed to the promised land. <laughs> they were headed to this land that was awesome, that was flowing with milk and honey. 
but they're complaining about the journey on the way. Even though they're with Jesus, like they're close with him and he's taking care of them. And I think a lot of times we do that. We complain about the journey. And anytime that I'm doing that, it's because I've taken my eyes off the destination. I've taken my eyes off of the things of heaven, off of the realities of heaven, where Jesus sits at the place of honor at God's right hand, and I'm focusing on something down here, something that's going on in the journey. And so how we endure the journey is we focus on the destination. Anyways, that's not the point. Here, let me keep going. So they, they began to speak against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out here, uh, out of Egypt, to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There is nothing to eat here and nothing to drink. And we hate this horrible manna. So God is literally feeding them with bread from heaven. And they're like, we hate this stuff. It's horrible. And so the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people. And many were bitten and died. And then the people came to Moses and cried out, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord told him, make a replica of a poisonous snake. And attach it to a pole. This is the snake that we're talking about that Ezekiel broke up. All who were bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made the snake out of bronze and attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by the snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. So there was this healing that happened if you would. And basically what it points to is 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made a replica because the, the poisonous snakes represent sin. They were real snakes though. And they were really biting people. But, but they represent sin. And so, like, there needed to be a replica of sin. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. So that he could be the sacrifice for us. Right? So he, he became a replica of us because we're sin. It's not something we do. It's something we are. Anyway, so, so what's interesting about this is that these people, they, see, they diagnosed it improperly. They thought that the problem was the snakes. See, they were all getting bit by snakes, and they went to Moses, and look what it says. It goes, hey, pray to the Lord that he'll take away the snakes. But see, Moses knew better. He was like, the snakes aren't the problem. And so it says that Moses prayed for the people. He was like, I'm not praying about the snakes. The snakes aren't the problem. In fact, the snakes are here because of you guys. And so, like, the snake was actually a symptom of what was going on with them because they were impatient. Right? They were impatient, and they spoke against God and Moses, and they complained, and it was because they were discontent. They had no contentment. They had no satisfaction. They're, they're eating bread that comes from heaven, and they're still, they're like, it's horrible. We don't like it. And so they're complaining, and, and it pointed to that there was something else that was missing. That's why in John 6, you know, Jesus feeds 5,000 people, and then he, he goes on to tell the people that they're chasing him around and they're following him around. And he goes, you guys are chasing me because you want some food. But you don't understand. The reason I fed you like that is so you would want me. And Jesus was telling the people, the reason you're not satisfied is because you don't consume me. And Jesus says, you have to consume me and then you'll be satisfied. And that's why he said, whoever eats this will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. And these people were thirsty and they were hungry. And so they, diag they diagnosed it the wrong way. What they thought was the problem wasn't actually the problem. They thought the snakes were the problem, but it really was a problem with them. That the snakes even existed. That's the reason he sent them. And so what's dangerous is, is all these 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 diagnoses that we have nowadays that people will put on you and say is your problem and say what's wrong with you is those start to become a little more than that. They start to become your identity. You know, people start to identify themselves with their problems. That's what I love uh, uh, about what Jesus has done here at Really Recover because there's all kinds of different people with all kinds of different problems and you go, oh yeah, well it's really recovered so most people are addicts. And I'm like, well yeah, because everybody's an addict. Everybody's addicted to themselves. That's really what it is. It's a self sin, is what it is. Everybody's addicted to themselves. Either it's their pride, or their self pity, or their self righteousness, or their self reliance, or their self confidence. It's just self. You can basically put self down and put a hyphen, and you're like, there you go. That's what you're addicted to. It's you. And it just shows up in different forms. 
And so, see, they diagnose this the wrong way, and they think the snakes are the problem, but the snakes aren't the problem. In fact, you know, even them growing impatient and complaining, that's not the problem. Even that is a symptom of a deeper issue, a spiritual issue, an emptiness that can only be filled by the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why he made the replica of the snakes. And he said, and that's why in John 3, 14, he's talking to Nicodemus and he tells him, hey, just as that snake was lifted up on a pole, so the son of man must be lifted up. Talking about the cross. And he goes, so that whoever believes in me, whoever comes and just looks at it. And that's what he's saying. Whoever puts their faith in it, whoever believes that it's going to heal them, whoever believes in Jesus, just like that, that bronze snake, he goes, they'll have eternal life. Boom. You see, and there's the treatment. As I was talking about the destination a little bit, there's the treatment for the disease. There's the cure. As he goes, man, you put your faith in me and I'll give you eternal life. And now you have this destination that changes everything. It changes everything. And so, uh, Ezekiel, back to him. Like, what does this mean? So, he broke up that snake. And, and it said, he, he tore down everything that people would worship except the Lord. Except Jesus. And I think that we can learn from that. Because there's some things in our lives this morning as we sit here. That, that tend to take first place. That tend to creep up. And take first place over Jesus. I think Jesus is just telling us this morning, you got to tear it down. you just got to tear it down. Whatever it is that's taking first place in your life, whatever it is that creeps in and takes over, you know, Jesus' place in your life, you got to tear it down. He said, man, he was pleased with Ezekiel because he did that. He tore down all that stuff. He got rid of all that stuff. And it said, Ezekiel trusted in the Lord, and he remained faithful to the Lord in everything. And so the Lord was with him. And one of the things it says that he did that was pleasing to the Lord was he revolted against the king of Assyria and refused to pay him tribute. And so what happens just a few verses later, the king of Assyria in his 14th year of reign in verse 13, he comes and he attacks the fortified towns of Judah and he conquers them. And so King Ezekiel finds himself here, this guy who has just trusted Jesus with everything, this guy who has removed everything that gets in the way of Jesus being first and number one, finds himself looking around, and some of his fortified cities start to fall. And what's he going to do? Is he going to trust still in Jesus? Or is he going to take matters into his own hands? And so we see what he does is it says he goes to the king of Assyria and says, I have done wrong. I will pay you whatever tribute money you demand if you will only withdraw. And see, that is the moment. Now, this is the sneaky pride that people don't realize. It's like when we think of pride, a lot of times we think about it as arrogance and we think of it as just like I'm awesome. And, and you look at this and you go, man, he's willing to pay whatever tribute to the king of Assyria. So really, he's being kind of humble. He's kind of submitting. But really, he's not. Because what he's done is he's taken matters into his own hands. And when you take matters into your own hands, there's pride in that. There's self in that. And so he thinks, man, it's time to act. And what I want to remind us of is there's this awesome Psalm 46. And it goes, man, we trust in Jesus. Even when, you know, there's earthquakes and mountains are falling into the seas and all that. And it's just this, this picture of chaos. And it has one of the most popular verses. Be still and know that I'm God. It's in the middle of just the craziest stuff that's happening. And God goes, hey, be still. It's not time for you to do anything. It's not time for you to take matters into your own hands. Psalm 27 is the same kind of thing. David is surrounded by enemies. And he goes, man, I'm surrounded. I'm attacked all day long. And what happens in that? He goes, but the thing that I want the most, the thing that I desire the most, is to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and meditate on him. And then everything changes after that verse where he's just praising Jesus because you know, he's not focused on this anymore. He's not focused down here anymore. 
And see, just like what's happening here with Ezekiel, he's in the middle of an attack. And Satan loves to attack us and get us to focus on ourselves. That's exactly what happens. And we start to think we got to do something and we got to take matters into our own hands. And so I'm sure what happened here is that some fear creeped in. He's looking around and he's watching his fortified townsfolk. And see, what we don't realize a lot of times is that fear is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to either, either be prideful or be humble. You're going to react one way or the other. One way or the other, when you're faced with fear, is either you're going to rely on yourself and take matters into your own hands, or you're going to humble yourself and be still and know that Jesus is God. And so it's an opportunity, and this is why all through the Bible, Jesus says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, because he's telling you, humble yourself and trust in him. And trust in him. And so he's faced with fear here. He takes matters into his own hands. And it says, King Ezekiel, and the tribute that he asked for is just crazy. It's 11 tons of silver, one ton of gold. And so to gather this amount, King Ezekiel used all the silver stored in the temple of the Lord in the palace treasury. Ezekiel even stripped the gold from the doors of the Lord's temple and from the doorposts he had overlaid with gold and he gave it all to the Assyrian king. He looks like a tweaker right here. <laughs> right? I mean, right? He's like, I can sell my Xbox one. I mean, he's, he's, he's in this moment where he's stripping stuff down from the temple and, and willing to get rid of it to try and satisfy his fear, to try and ease his fear. And so, like, I just couldn't help it when I saw that. I'm like, he's tweaking. <laughs> he is. He's freaking out. And, he, and he's willing to sell anything to get what he thinks is going to fix the problem. And listen, guys, that's no different than, 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 than when you've been on the streets and you've been running around getting high and stuff and drinking and stuff. You think that the problem you have is that you don't have that. You know there's something missing and you think the problem you have is that you don't have that. And you'll go to any length to try and get that, to fill that, so that you feel like you're at peace. But the problem is, is it always leaves you hungry and it always leaves you thirsty. Because it's only temporary. It's never satisfying. And so what does all this have to do with the diagnosis? So look, over in chapter 20, 2 Kings chapter 20. I have to give you some backstory so we know where we're headed. So, in 2 Kings chapter 20, it says, About the time, about that time, Ezekiel became deathly ill. So listen to me. The Bible does this a lot of times. It's not in chronological order through these chapters. What it's saying, it was saying in a story there in chapter 18, 19. When it gets to 20, it's going, hey, at the same time, he became deathly ill. And so it went from bad to worse. Like he's getting attacked. All that stuff's going on. He takes his trust out of Jesus. He puts it in himself. And now he becomes deathly ill. And so it's all happening at the same time. And so it goes from bad to worse. And it says, and, and Isaiah shows up, right? And you think you've had a doctor come in and say some stuff to you before that might have been bad news. Man, Isaiah shows up like, I have a word from the Lord. <laughs> and it isn't good. Isaiah shows up and goes, the Lord of heaven's armies. Hey, Got a, got a diagnosis for you. And he goes, set your affairs in order, for you are going to die. You will not recover from this illness. It would have been really easy for Ezekiel to sink down into that diagnosis and just go, that's all over. I can't go on. Listen, where Jesus wants to stretch our faith today is do you believe that Jesus still heals? I mean, do you really believe that? I mean, in Luke 8, you see Jesus walking along and Jairus comes and goes, hey, my daughter's deathly ill. Will you come and heal her? And he's on his way there and there's a crowd around him. And there's a woman in that crowd who has been bleeding.
for 12 years, nonstop. And it says in Mark 5, it has her story as well. And in Mark 5, it says that she tried every doctor and she tried everything she could. And it just got worse. And it just got worse. It didn't get any better. And yet she knows if I can just touch Jesus, if I can just touch the clothes that are on, I know he can heal me. And she creeps in and she grabs his robe and Jesus realizes he's surrounded by a crowd of people touching him. But he knows when the one touches him that has complete faith that he can do what nobody else can do. He knows he stops and he goes, who touched me? And Peter's like, everybody. Everybody's touched you. And Jesus goes, no, but the, this one. This one that touched me is different. He goes, I felt healing power go out from me. And she comes forward and she's trembling as we should at Jesus and his power. And now listen, this isn't some faith healing sermon where I'm going to ask you for 200 bucks and you're going to get healed. This is the power of Jesus that still heals. And so Lots of people sitting in this room have been diagnosed with bipolar and all kinds of different things that the world says never goes away. It's only treatable with medication. And yet lots of people in this room, as I look around, I can point them out, have been completely healed by Jesus. Jesus wants us to get back to really believing this. Oh, you go, well, what about the medicine, okay? Yeah, I'm not sitting up here. This isn't going to be some war on medicine. What I do know is that a medicine doesn't heal you unless Jesus allows it. That Tylenol doesn't work unless Jesus lets it. It's that simple. It's that simple. And so... Then what's he do? What's he say right after that? He heals that, that woman, and, and, and Jairus' daughter dies. And he, he goes, don't bother. Don't bother coming, Jesus. It's too late. And Jesus just looks at him, and he goes, just have faith, and it'll be okay. Just believe, and it'll be okay. So I guess Jesus was the original faith healer. Because all three, he goes, hey, nothing's impossible if you have faith. Hey, you can move mountains if you have faith. He, he talked about it as if it was something that was real. And so we should believe that as well. And so Hezekiah gets this news, and he gets this diagnosis that's just fatal, that's over. And it would have been really easy for him to just fall into it and just accept that. I mean, it's not like it came from a person. It came from the creator of the universe. And even then, he turns his face to the wall and prays to the Lord. You see how we get to see him act two different ways when faced with fear? At first, he acted in pride. He took things into his own hands. He tried to do it on his own. And then now we see Jesus sends him an illness. That's what it says in Isaiah 38. He offers a prayer after that when he's healed. And he goes, it was good for me. The anguish was good for me. He goes, now I'll walk humbly the rest of my years. And see, so what it was was Jesus in his love getting his attention. And he, he turns his face to the wall and he prays, remember, O oh Lord, how I have always been faithful to you and served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. Then he broke down and wept, wept bitterly. So we're talking like ugly cry. You know, like, we're not just talking about like, oh, please, Jesus. Like, no ugly cry, snot running down in his beard and everything, you know, like just a hot mess. Everybody's looking at him like, he's your tissue. And he's just a mess. And he's humbling himself. He starts by going, I, I, I remember. He's even probably at this point remembering. And I tore everything down. I did all, yeah, I trusted you wholeheartedly, single-mindedly. And it brings him back to this place of humility where he breaks down and he cries. And he weeps bitterly. 
And you see this picture of humility and trust again in Jesus. And it says, before Isaiah had even left the middle courtyard, this message came to him from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, and tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears, and I will heal you. See, one of the other things, it's in the, the, the Talmud, is Hezekiah's, uh, one of the, I don't know, accomplishments, whatever you want to call it, is that he did away with the Book of Remedies. And so what the Book of Remedies was, it was a book where they could flip open in there and they could, you know, if they had sickness or they had illness, and it had all these different remedies. And it's almost like, well, they're like, what, WebMD? <laughs> it's like, that, that would be the equivalent of it. Where you, and, I, and I tried WebMD the other day. It was funny. While I was praying about this, I just went on there and I thought about who I used to be apart from Jesus. And I started to put in symptoms. I'm like, well, I'm angry. And I'm sad. And I don't really feel like getting out of bed. And they were like, you got clinical depression. They were like, try this antidepressant. They just kicked it out right away. It just diagnosed me off some symptoms like that. And so it was similar to that. And it wasn't that the book wasn't working. It was that people weren't trusting in Jesus. That he did away with it. And so we find him in a position right here where, you know, the creator of the universe is going, you want to put your money where your mouth is? Because now you're sick. And he goes, man, I've heard you, and I will heal you. And why does he say he's going to heal him? This is important. Because a lot of times our motives are all messed up in wanting to be healed or wanting Jesus to do something. He goes, I will heal you. And three days from now, you will get out of bed and go to the temple of the Lord. Why would you go to the temple of the Lord? To worship him and give him glory. Right? So that's the first thing. He goes, hey, I'm going to heal you so that you can give me glory. And he goes, I will add 15 years to your life, and I will rescue you. And this city from the king of Assyria. So it's kind of that thing where he does even more than we can imagine. Even more than we're asking for. See right here, Ezekiel is just going, man, just can you heal me? And he goes, not only am I going to heal you, but I'm going to rescue the city. And we kind of heard that with Gina as she sat up here. And she was like, man, Thailand was doing great. But you know, my family that hadn't been together for a really long time. All of a sudden that got restored. Jesus does more than we could even ask or imagine. That's what he says. And it's all for his glory. And so he says, I'll rescue you in this city for my honor, for my own honor, for the sake of my servant David. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, he made a promise to David. Someone will always sit on your throne. And so Jesus is good for his promise. He can't lie. He's not like us. And that's what we see. And so he goes, hey, I'm going to heal you, but I'm going to do it for my glory. So that Jesus' glory can be seen. And so what's he say? He goes, hey, make an ointment from figs. So Hezekiah's servants spread the ointment over the boil and Hezekiah recovered. So right here, you're really tempted to go, see, he uses medicine. And sure, if you want to call it that. The translation of this is, is, a, is a fig cake. So I just so happened to have some fig newtons. I don't know what they're doing over there. I don't know. Just happened to be in the sermon. And so the next time you got a headache, eat one of these. Right? That's what we see. And the next time you cut yourself, just like lay it on there. You cut your hand. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. I mean, why aren't people still using fig cakes to this day to heal stuff? Well, it's all about the faith. And, and like I said, if he uses medicine, he uses it. Medicine doesn't work unless Jesus allows it to work. He says, man, I, 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 both, I both take life and give it. I wound and I heal. Guys, I've read some stuff in this book lately. I don't eat on Sundays until after I preach. I've read some stuff in this book lately that has completely changed my outlook 
on just death in general and all that stuff. Like, I thought a lot about death this week. You, you realize, in Revelation chapter 14, Jesus is sitting on a cloud with a sickle. When is the last time you saw the Grim Reaper look like that? It's just crazy that the world just has this big black robe and it's just from Satan. Jesus is sitting on a cloud with a sickle. And he goes, it's time to harvest the whole earth. And he does. And then another angel comes out with another sickle. And he goes, it's judgment time. It's judgment time. And this other angel harvests what's left for judgment. And it's like 180 miles of blood. As high as like a, a horse's bridle. So you're talking chin height of a horse. Just flowing. I just, I've, been, I've been reading this book lately and I've just been trembling in the presence of Jesus. We're really missing out on that part where it says, fear the Lord. It's not some black robe, whatever. And so, he gives him a fig newton to heal his boil. And it says he recovered. He recovered. He wasn't in recovery. He didn't constantly have to come eat fig newtons. He recovered. Past tense. Better than he was. And he asks for a sign. And he goes, hey, what's the sign that God's going to do what he said he's going to do? And Isaiah gives him an option. He says, hey, there's a sundial sitting there. And and it, it, how sundials work, there's a shadow on it. And the shadow moves and tells you the time. And Isaiah goes, do you want him to move the sundial forward or backwards? And Ezekiel goes, well, the, sun, the sundial, the, the shadow always moves forward. He goes, make it move backwards. And he does. Like, just for a minute, <laughs> try and wrap your mind around what that means. So the earth is spinning. <laughs> and it's not just spinning, it's rotating and orbiting around the sun. <laughs> and Jesus went, er, spun it the other way and moved it back. And let it go again. He, he moved heaven and earth to show his love to Ezekiel. He moved heaven and earth to show his love to Ezekiel. See, you don't realize this sometimes when you got some kind of ailment, you got some kind of sickness, and I get it, you go, well, well, what about the people that don't know Jesus that get healed? Well, that's because Jesus allows that. We were just talking about that. That's Matthew 5. I think it's 45 where it says he gives his sunlight to both those that are righteous and those that are wicked. He gives his rain to both those that are just and unjust. Why? Because in Romans 1 it says that nobody has an excuse for not knowing Jesus and his goodness. <coughs> that you can clearly see through everything he's made and everything he's done, his invisible qualities and his goodness. In 2 Chronicles 7, 13, he says, I'll shut up the heavens, and sometimes your crops will get eaten by grasshoppers or whatever, and it's some kind of bug. I think it's grasshoppers. And, 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 and he goes, but if, You'll turn to me and humble yourself and seek my face. You see where he goes? I'll move heaven and earth so you know how much of that I love you. He goes, I will shut up the heavens so that you'll look to me and realize that the creator of the universe not only made you, but that he loves you and he's calling you back to him.
And it wouldn't be the only time. In Luke chapter 24, I spent time this week just, I just went to the Gospels and I just read the death of Jesus. I just went to each Gospel and I read the death of Jesus. And in Luke 24, it was about noon and darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. And the light from the sun was gone. It's noon. It's the hottest time of the day. And Jesus moves the heavens to show you his love and get your attention. It says the curtain in the sanctuary was torn down the middle. In Matthew it says the earth shook and rocks split apart and tombs were opened. And so you go, well, what about when you don't get healed? Well, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he dealt with this. He said he had a messenger from Satan to keep him humble. And he begged three times that Jesus would take it away. And each time Jesus said, no. He said, my grace is all you need. So even when that prayer isn't answered, it's good. And you go, well, Jesus, are you sure? Well, Jesus was in the garden and his soul was crushed. And just a, a couple chapters earlier in Luke, he says in Luke 22, verse 41, where he walked about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed and said, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done and not mine. Jesus showed us what it looks like to hear no and be okay with it. To hear no and know that it's the best thing, not just for us, but for everyone else. And so we go back to Luke 24, or Luke 23, my bad, verse 44, and he says, By this time about noon, darkness fell across the whole land, rocks are splitting apart, the earth's shaking, tombs are opening, and once again, Jesus is moving heaven and earth to show you his love. And he goes, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. He shows us what it looks like to, to die well. I mean, the criminal on the cross said, I don't even want to get down from here. Just take me with you. I just want to be with you, Jesus. Don't you want your death to mean something for Jesus? I don't care how crazy that sounds. I don't care how much trouble that gets me in. I pray that often. Jesus, I don't want to just live for you. I want to die for you. I want everything to count for you. I want every breath that you've given this body to mean something for you and your glory. <coughs> and what happens right after that happens? It says, the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened and he worshipped God. Listen to that. The Roman officer overseeing the execution. The one that called the whole regiment out so they could mock him and beat him and hit him with a stick and put a crown of thorns on him and punch him and rip his beard out and spit on him. Whip him, hit him, tear his flesh off of his body, mangle him to where the Bible said he didn't even look like a man. That guy. He moved heaven and earth so that guy would know his love and fall down after he died and go, I worship you, God. This truly was the Son of God. He gives his life right there at the crucifixion. That's us. That's us. That's us. Where he moved heaven and earth 
to show us that he loved us. Where the cure, so you can die well when you know your destination. It's Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego where they go, we know, we know Jesus can save us, and we believe he will. And even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we trust him. Because they know their destination. It's the cure. Where, see, this is so much bigger than recovery. This is about, this is why it's called really recover. Because that Roman officer who was in charge of his execution was recovered that day. He was redeemed. He was purchased by Jesus on the cross. What was lost has now been brought back, has now been bought back. Redeemed also means recovered. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And he goes on to say that it wasn't just paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. And now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Recovered by the precious blood of Jesus. That's what it cost to redeem his glory. That's what it cost to redeem his people that were lost. And see, you can be recovered. Recovered. A whole new life. A whole new life. And so be careful what you let people diagnose you with. And no matter what they diagnose you with, even if they're right, do you know that Jesus can heal you? Do you know that Jesus saves people? Like, think about that. Jesus saves people. He heals people. He changes people. He can change anything. Anything. Do you believe that? Let's pray.